Your toughest work is defining what your work is. He put it in broad terms. This is very specifically what he's talking about. What is the work embedded in that and getting very clear about that? And I guarantee you if you sat down and take at least a few of the things off your list and make these decisions, what's the project? Write it down. What's the action step? Write it down. You will feel exponentially more appropriately engaged with your world. Never seen an exception to that. You come to Hollywood and you're chasing this dream. You want to be an actor, you know? Like, there's not a ton of milestones that are crystal clear that you know what they look like. Because for the most part, the things that are gonna help you get to your goal are, are movies that haven't been written yet, they're jobs that haven't uh, existed yet. You're kind of giving yourself over to this, this thing, saying like, please, I don't want to be a waiter anymore. I want to be an actor, you know? Yeah. And that's that. And, and so there's very few things that are crystal clear, like images of what you would want. And but one of them is to work with an icon, to work with somebody like a Steven Spielberg. And so like when you, so that to me was one of, you know, my goals. You wouldn't even want to say it out loud because it'd be so ridiculous. It's right. Like, yeah. What do you want to do, kid? Well, I want to work with Steven Spielberg. And they'd be like, nah, I don't know, you know. <laughs> Just go with your gut, you know? There's a reason why you think the way you do and, and, and want to do the things you do, and you just can't let anybody tell you don't do it. But especially you. Don't allow you to tell you not to do it. Mm. You know, the, the loudest voice uh, that, that's a contrarian is usually me. And um, it, you know, all these little moments of confirmation that that voice should just shut up um, allows you to just do what you're supposed to do while you're here. yourself, what if no one ever bought any of my work? What if I'm never going to sell a book or publish a book or a short story? Are you going to continue to write? And if the answer is yes, because I have to, then yeah, then you are a writer. And whether you'll sell or not, I can't know. But uh, the, the, if there are stories in you that have to get out, you want to put them down in the paper, whether, whether you ever get the affirmation of uh, a contract or a book in your hand or being on the bestseller list, if you still have to tell your stories, then, then you're a writer. Uh, if you can give it up, then, then it probably would be an act of sanity to, to learn accounting or uh, something like that. Being on this planet, one of the first things people would say, if we were all dumped down here, yeah. let us say there were only ten of us, right. and we were dropped into this planet uh, already formed, one of the first things we would say would, after a moment or two would be, is everybody okay? Let's get something to eat. And that should be the first thing any society says, is everybody okay? Let's get something to eat. Right. And we don't, because we have this private property thing, property property rights over people's rights. And I just think that, that competition got the upper hand over cooperation. This species was successful. Because, uh, and as part of the American experience? No, as part of the human species. The human species. The, 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 the verge of failure that we're on is because two wonderful qualities that made us a successful species, cooperation and competition, right. are way out of balance. Now, competition is everything. Cooperation happens after a flood. Happens for a few days, yeah, everybody goes back right. to where they were before. Happen after That's hurricane. Right. And we need, we need to get that balance back. If we can get that balance back, there's, there's hope. I think people need to get, sit down and clarify, what experiences are you really looking for in your life? And that doesn't necessarily mean, it can include lots of money, but it can also include what do you want to experience with that money? A sense of freedom, a sense of service, a sense of providing value to the world, a sense of self-confidence and self-efficacy. What is it that you're after? So there's, you know, in my own, you know, explorations and the whole personal growth and self-awareness, you know, game for years, I've been involved in that pretty seriously. You know, there's an exercise that say, well, what do you want? I want a red Porsche. Great. What experience do you think that's going to give you? freedom and a sense of fun, whatever. And then the people get the red Porsche and they're worried about somebody gonna dent it and they, you know, they can't afford the payments on it. 
they didn't really get the experience they were looking for. What happened? They got the, the, the they got the, the symbol, but they didn't get the inner experience. But if you want the experience of freedom and fun, you can have that this afternoon. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have the red Porsche, but it just means that if you start to focus on the inner experience, what would climbing the corporate ladder give you as an inner experience? Why do you want that? What's important to you about that? And it could be, it could be I want to I want to provide, you know, for my family for you know for after I'm gone. So there's a sense of building wealth or building net worth or building assets, you know, for the people around you that that care, that, that matter to you. That's there's no right or wrong about any of your answers to this. But I think getting clear about whether you want to do that or whether you want to get there because you want to be able to impact a much larger segment of the world for doing good or taking it over, I don't know, or what, you know, whatever you want. But I think that's the key, is being able to externalize and start to become objective about, well, you know, what is it that you're after? And so just crafting your own ideal scene. Not only of the things you want, which is fine, don't, don't stop that. As a matter of fact, don't feel embarrassed that you want a red portion. So there's nothing wrong with any of that material stuff that you might want, but it's also true that it's a real good idea to just I don't know, say, let me just lay that all out. And then use that as a, as a map just to then guide you in terms of your intuitive decision making. I don't think you have to work at it that hard, but I think you do need to be conscious about it and validate it in some part of yourself. Don't take no for an answer. If it's, if you're not work, if it's not working well that night, it's not you, it's the audience. Blame it on the audience. Because if it worked on Friday night, it ought to work on Saturday, and if it doesn't, it's their fault. It's over simple, but you know what? It works as a formula. Just go on and do the Sunday night show and forget Saturday night. Keep kicking them in the nuts. People have a hard time doing nothing. But we know now, in terms of brain science, that you need as much time to let your brain relax and be spontaneous and daydream in order to refresh its decision-making cognitive power. Because you only have a limit of that. And so if you're not napping, if you're not getting enough sleep, if you're not backing off and letting your mind just relax and wander, then you're sub-optimizing your cognitive abilities. So, you know, yeah. Most people procrastinate though because they're afraid of stepping into something you don't feel like you can be successful at. So just the simple idea of deciding what's the very next action I need to take, oftentimes people's lists do not have next actions. All life is magical. It is magic, you see because we're the instruments, and all problems are technical. And once you can go through those problems without avoiding them or backing off them from them, because all, you know, it's like fear, you go through it. You go through the problem, confront it and go through it, then you have release. Stanislavski called it the plane of inspiration that takes off from the runway. You know, the runway is the technique, the runway is the getting on with it, and the plane will take off. If on Tuesday night, however, it doesn't quite take off, it doesn't matter, you can't stop the plane and say, well, I'll go back because I don't feel it tonight. You get on with it technically, and then on Wednesday night, probably it's going to take off again, as long as you're relaxed. But it really is, it's kind of being an automatic pilot. And I, I, I think it's, and it comes after experience. I think it comes, uh, and I think I feel in the happy state of mind now that uh, my, I have 15 years or 20 years of experience behind me. And I think it's used well, and, and uh, there's a lot of positive out of all the ang anguish and the pain and discomfort. And there have been good times, there have been negative times. But Olivia said once, when I, he was directing Colin Blakely in June and the Peacock, and I was in June and the Peacock, and he said, uh, he said, you have to find the middle man. And Blakely said, what do you mean? He said, Find the middle man, that ease of playing a character. And Blakely said, I only have until next week. And he said, you won't do it next week. It'll take you the next, the rest of your life. And it's really relaxing and letting go. You know, the booster that puts one into outer orbit, the aggression, the, the arrogance, and the ambition and all that, that's all very necessary. But there's a time when one has to let go. And I guess I'm in orbit. And I, all I have to do is rest assured that it's going to be OK and do what is required of me, you know, keep in practice keep working, I'm going back to the theatre, I want to go back to the theatre, and I, I, I'm, I'm being kind to myself. I, um, that's all I can say, really. 
Then the magic happens. Schofield is right. You get on with it. John Dexter told me in New York, he said, just get on with it. Don't analyze. Do it. People talk about, oh, you need a vacation or something. I don't, uh, a vacation from what? I, mm -hmm. I love my life. I, I feel uh, I'm healthy, thank God. And, uh, you know, I have these incredible directors that, that are interested in, in, in working with me, and I'm going to jump at that. Uh, Actually, NASA's cool. Actually, the most productive times I am is when I have the freedom to make a creative mess. You too. You need, I, need, I need room to, to be crazy, to make some mistakes, to brainstorm, to be chaotic, go a little off the edge. That is going to be your most productive time, is when you have that kind of freedom to do that. However, folks, if you're already in a mess, you ain't got room to make one. If your kitchen's a mess, you don't have time or the energy to have a creative dinner for your friends. If your desk and your office are a mess, you don't have room and space to be you know, crazy about some new project and spread out and have brainstorm with ideas. If your email is backed up on you with a thousand unprocessed emails and you got 3,000 other things going on in your head, you have no space to take advantage of discretionary time that may show up in terms of being creative, in terms of your energy. The results of that, if you're trying to use your psyche to manage that mess and you never get out of it, is you get the results of two things that are the critical elements of self and, and organizational productivity. You'll lose perspective. That is, you lose the ability to put your focus where you need it on exactly the thing you need it, at the horizon you need it. And or you may be experiencing the results of what happens when you lose control. That is, I now don't have stability and I don't have the freedom in my head to be able to put the appropriate attention and execute on it when I do. So those are the two key elements. Folks, you can't manage time. You don't mismanage five minutes and come up with six. The only time that you think you need time management is when one or both of these two dynamics is suboptimal. Either things need to be more under control or more appropriately focused. If you map those two things together, what do you get? If you, on the bottom left here, where you got no control and no focus, ever been there? That's your basic vic victim experience. You know, driven by latest and loudest. For the most part, most of us are, are thrown there by our own overcommitments and creativity. We're just trying to come up for air. Now, if that part of you shows up that has high focus and perspective, but no control, now you're the mad scientist. Now you're the desperate artiste. Now you're the crazy maker with all kinds of crazy ideas and no constraints of what you're doing. You're nothing very well organized. Middle of the morning, you decide to go buy the new iPhone, but your IT department won't support it. On the other hand, you can get down in the weeds and say, oh, wait a minute, I need to get 10,000 things organized. I need to get all this cleaned up. I need to... And now you get into micromanagement. If you don't have appropriate focus, you can get down on those weeds and hung up in them like crazy. And you'll spend a lot of time you know, doing a lot of trying to get organized about things that may not be that important. Right. In the morning, your crazy maker said, get a new iPhone. In the afternoon, you spend two hours of what could be a strategic afternoon trying to set up the right ringtones. Here's what's true about all three of those, folks. You ain't ready for what's coming towards you. You will be suboptimal in terms of your ability to handle the surprises, and they're coming. Good, bad, or indifferent, they're coming. Trust me. And you want to be optimally available for those things when they come to you. That's what we all do. We get to a certain age, we all stay in our comfort zone with our recliners watching television day in and day out. And um, we get to a certain age, I'm going to be 70 at the end of the year, where I sit around watching television for the rest of my life because I've done it all, sitting on my laurel wreath. It's not worth it. I mean, life's so short, there's such glorious images in the world and such horror as well, that I want to see it all. And so I've moved out of my comfort zone. It's um, essential for me, otherwise I may as well die. So I've done it, every, I've broken every rule in the book, and um, not out of malice or any 
telling anyone that I'll show you. I did it for to show myself. I've shown myself. I looked in the mirror and thought, I'll show you one day. And I've done something completely new. I wrote the music and I feel limitless. I woke up every morning excited. I was completely jacked. I've never been more excited to go to work every day as I was on this project. At the end of the day, I've never been more drained in my life. But somehow, some way, I found the energy every morning to get up and just go for it. And the further we got into it, the more Wayne was just like, okay, do what you want to do. Do what you want to do. And uh, I never had that kind of freedom before. I just want to get better. I want to get better and I want to work with great people. It's really simple. I don't want to be pushed, I think I push myself. So mm -hmm. the, the, I never, I have a pretty strong engine of, of, of wanting to uh, grow, so. Uh, there were moments, you know, when I was learning the script and I thought, well, this isn't going to work. I mean, how, how, how can I do it? But I, I, I used to write notes to myself, little letters to myself, and put them on the desk saying, you know, you can do any, you know, anything with faith, you can move mountains and uh, um, trust and let go and all that sort of thing, you know, and I used to just throw myself into it. And then the, when the negatives came to my mind, I would uh, put positive, um, positive sounds in my head, you know, make... I'd say I can do it, you know, and I, I used to meditate and uh, visualize myself doing it. And I used to visualize myself on like a kind of, um, try and visualize myself doing those sort of fanning cards and spinning them and, and gradually, surprising the power of mind, what happens, you know, your muscles begin to respond. It's like anything really, if you're playing the piano or driving a car, it comes through relaxation. And I've realized over the years that I've gone through many changes in my life. Um, many changes because that's the nature of life. And if you don't go with it, you may as well die, really. You may as well be dead. I know people who live in the past, they just live there all the time, talking about something that happened to them 30 years ago. They're like zombies. I suppose we compensate for our lives, for our lacks, if we choose to. Because I felt so lacking as a child in my adolescent years and early adult years. I, through anger, or resentment, or drive, or ambition, or whatever, I found my way somehow. I don't actually believe I did it totally on my own. I believe in some power of life that is in us. I'm a fatalist, I believe in destiny, I believe that if we relax and let go enough and actually do believe that our lives are none of our business and open up, then extraordinary things begin to happen. I suppose you're calling them, to right. talk about spiritual surrender mm -hmm. somewhere. So, you know, when we try to, I mean, I, my, my agent many, many years ago, I had an agent once, a very nice chap, but he said, he said, we've got to plan your career. I mean, that sent me running out of the door. I mean, you can't oh, plan no, your life. No. I mean, I wouldn't care for that. You, know, you make certain choices and you go along and uh, right. you, you, know, you, you chart the rapids and the rocks and the shallows and the depths and so on and so forth. Right. But you can't really control your destiny. You can't really control things. You just have to let go and follow it. As much as I can without driving myself insane. Because there's a negative side of perfectionism. In my nature anyway, I can only speak for myself. There's a negative flaw and there's a very dangerous trap and I think one of the biggest killers is ego. And when it's the negative side of perfectionism, when one starts playing God, you know, and I mean literally, there is a killer, there is a, a lethal part of one's own ego. I don't know if I believe in anything, I mean, I'm a deity, but I believe whatever 
that thing is that we talk about the centuries. I think it's just within us. I mean, things have remarkable things have happened in my life by by just wishing or asking for something for a bit of help. Yes, and can and I don't believe I'm not a I'm an agnostic. I guess is there, is there any way you can help me or whatever? And there's something inside us that will respond. I believe. I be, I really believe that we have to make our lives because life is tough. We have to believe in the power of life.